No. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started here. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Roger Vargas. Roger's been a research entomologist for the USDA Agriculture Research Service for the last 30 years. Uh, currently is working out of the Pacific Basin Agriculture Research Center in Hilo, Hawaii. He received his bachelor degree in zoology from the University of California, Riverside, a master's in biology from San Diego State University, and a PhD in entomology from the University of Hawaii. Roger is the author or co-author of more than 185 scientific papers and book chapters. During the last seven years, he has served as co-coordinator of the Hawaii Fruit Fly Area-Wide Pest Management Program that has been recognized with seven major awards. Today, he will be speaking to us on area-wide fruit fly programs in Hawaii, French Polynesia, and California. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Vargas. Thanks, Jane. So um, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to come to uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, some people may not know it, but uh, in, the, um, in the late uh, 70s, I was uh, going to come here to graduate school. And uh, before I made it up here to graduate school, I had a TA ship and everything. I took a detour to Hawaii and uh, never made it back. And so uh, I wound up out in, in Hawaii, went to graduate school out there, and uh, I've been out there ever since. But uh, besides that, uh, uh, we've had a lot of cooperation with UC Davis here, and, and uh, much of it has been through uh, Jim Carrey's uh, laboratory. Unfortunately, I gave this, this presentation to Jim before uh, uh, I presented it, and uh, he didn't like his picture, so he removed it. <laughs> and, and so, but anyways, all of you know what, uh, what uh, Jim looks like. And uh, during the last, uh, it must be about the last uh, 25 years, uh, some of the <laughs> students that uh, we have had have been uh, uh, David Kranecker, um, who uh, is a physician now. He's not even in entomology, but uh, David Foote. Uh, David Foote is still out in Hawaii, and uh, he's with the U.S. Geological uh, Survey Group uh, studying endemic uh, insects. Uh, we had uh, Ping Jung Yang. Uh, 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 Jim helped him escape from uh, China, and uh, he also uh, settled in, uh, in Hawaii, and uh, he's over at the uh, Department of Health. And I had forgotten about Rachel Freeman, but uh, I guess she's working around, uh, around here. And uh, uh, she called me just the other day and reminded me, so uh, she's going to come out to the meetings in Hawaii. And then, I don't know why Jim removed James's name, but... Remove him. <laughs> but I swear his name was really is James. So he he got a, 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 he got carried away, James. <laughs> Anyways, uh, 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 James has been uh, out in Hawaii working with us most recently, and uh, and and so is Amy. They've been both out there uh, doing some very nice work. So. Uh, 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 I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, three large programs that I've been involved in and uh, um, uh, as way of an introduction uh, uh, with globalization uh, there's been a, a big increase in the spread of uh, fruit flies uh, throughout the world and uh, part of this has been there's been increased production of fruits uh, uh, and, and vegetables worldwide and then there's been a lot of, uh, of trade in uh, fruits and vegetables so even the smallest of countries now, Senegal, uh, uh, you name it, uh, French Polynesia, they, would, they want to uh, sell tropical fruits uh, uh, worldwide. And there's been a lot of, of, of uh, reduction in restrictions, and consequently you're seeing uh, a great spread in uh, fruit flies. And then just the trade and movement of plants, like uh, in many instances they've uh, shipped the plants and uh, there's uh, invasive species in these uh, plants. And then once uh, the uh, flies are being, or fruits are being introduced into different areas, there's movement of people uh, uh, among the nearby countries. And then of course there's been uh, increased uh, uh, travel, uh, especially with tourists and baggage. But uh, I, uh, there we are. So, I think I better find another pointer. Yeah. Oh, there we are. So um, just since uh, 1990, this was a slide uh, uh, 
uh, de Meyer uh, presented in Valencia recently, but if you take a look at uh, recent invasions, you can see what's been happening. Um, uh, the peach fruit fly has been introduced into uh, Mar Mauritius uh, reunion, um, Bactrocera caramboli into uh, Suriname in uh, 95, papaya into uh, northern um, uh, Australia, uh, Bactrocera dorsalis in Tahiti. Uh, many people consider these all to be the same species, but they're all part of this uh, Bactrocera dorsalis uh, complex. Of course, all of you are familiar about the uh, introduction and establishment of the uh, olive fly uh, into, the, uh, into California. Um, Xanthodes, Bactrocera xanthodes into French Polynesia. Uh, the peach fruit fly into Egypt. The melon fly into uh, the Seychelles. And uh, most recently, um, there's been a tremendous uh, invasion and, and colonization all, uh, throughout Africa with uh, this uh, Bactrocera invadens, which many people, and I think genetic analyses are going to show that it's possibly the same species as uh, Dorsalis, and then also uh, uh, the Malaysian fruit fly. Uh, so in the Bactrocera species, it's a genus of about 400, uh, in, in 440 species and attacks uh, a wide range of, uh, of fruits and vegetables, uh, particularly in the, uh, in the tropics and in the warmer temperate areas. And most species are found in uh, tropical Asia, Australia, and the South Pacific. But as you can see, they're going to be almost everywhere if people uh, uh, continue with their, uh, their current activities. Um, this is a slide from uh, uh, SPC that uh, did a survey of, of the Pacific. Gives you an idea of, of, of how many Bactrocera are out there. Um, uh, with just lures and, and host records, uh, these are the species that they found uh, throughout the Pacific with, uh, with a high of, of about 16 species in uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, a low of none in um, uh, New Zealand. Uh, we have uh, uh, three Bactrocera species in, in, in Hawaii, but you can see uh, the biggest concentration is in this area, and if we went back up further into uh, to Asia, we'd find uh, there are a lot of species there. But if you put a, a wanted dead or alive poster down at the post office and put all those species uh, on, on one poster, this is what it would look like. So these are the 32 uh, species of economic importance that are just sitting out there in the Pacific. So uh, just briefly something about the, uh, uh, the laboratory that, that, that I'm from. Um, you know, USDA has, uh, has conducted research out in Hawaii for uh, about the, the, the last 100 years, actually 90 years. Most of the area-wide control um, approaches were were developed by USDA in Hawaii. This has included attractants for detection and control of fruit flies. Um, the first uh, uh, demonstration of male annihilation for eradication of, of fruit flies was done in the, uh, in the Northern Marianas. They developed the, uh, the first commercial rearing diet, which allowed them to, uh, uh, to develop the uh, sterile insect technique with uh, tropical uh, uh, fruit flies. And then uh, the mass production of, of fruit fly parasitoids and then area-wide IPM approaches. So today um, I am going to be uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, three programs. Uh, the first one's going to be the area-wide program in Hawaii. And then we're going to move down into the uh, southern hemisphere and I'll talk about a program in French Polynesia. And then we'll... Uh, uh, talk about your favorite place, uh, California. So uh, just uh, briefly something about the, uh, this program that I uh, was coordinating for the, uh, the last 10 years. Uh, it uh, began in 1999. It was a partnership with the uh, University of Hawaii and the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Um, it included research, education, and uh, assessment components. Uh, the goal was to uh, transfer uh, uh, novel, environmentally sound uh, uh, control products directly to the farmers, reduce the use of organophosphate insecticides, and uh, it was funded for, uh, 
for 10 years and then it was expected to be sustainable and uh, picked up by the uh, growers. We uh, had a, pro uh, we, we, it was a unique program in that we tackled a complex of fruit flies, uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly, the melon fly, the oriental fruit fly, and uh, the Malaysian fruit fly. Uh, together, uh, this, this complex has a, a host range of about 400 different species of fruits and vegetables in Hawaii. But uh, very quickly, the program involved uh, uh, population monitoring, uh, field sanitation, uh, the use of protein baits, male annihilation, sterile insects, and, and uh, parasitoids. We didn't use all of these components uh, in, in uh, tackling the different species, but in some instances we, we, we did use all six components. And this was probably the, uh, um, the best uh, uh, demonstration of, of, of this area-wide approach. This was up where I live, up in uh, Waimea on the Big Island, and uh, we were controlling uh, melon fly, and uh, this is, is briefly kind of the formula that we use. We would uh, we do population monitoring to determine uh, the, the species that was doing the most damage, and then field sanitation. It's all it, the most important thing we found in this uh, in, 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 in this program was that farmers were often their worst enemies. They just did not practice good sanitation, and they made the problem uh, uh, worse on themselves. And then. Uh, uh, I'll be talking more about uh, the uh, male annihilation and GF120. And then in this instance, we used uh, uh, releases of uh, Cetelia fletcheri, which is a parasitoid of the uh, melon fly. And then we also did uh, these uh, SIT releases. And you can see in this instance, we almost had eradication through, throughout a, a relatively uh, large area. And this is just uh, some idea of uh, the approach because uh, there's a series of islands in Hawaii. We had demonstration um, uh, areas on each of the major islands and then tried through the university extension to transfer the technologies to uh, the different uh, cooperating uh, groups. But in, in looking at, at some of our initial areas, uh, this was some baseline data that, that were collected at the beginning of the program, and here we would have uh, maybe 12 flies per trap per day, 100, 135. You can see the reductions that we were able to get through the program, uh, almost less than zero here, around five here, and 25. And we had these tremendous uh, reductions in infestation, so it looks like we were able to reduce infestation to uh, uh, a livable level, uh, level of maybe, say, 5%. And most importantly, we were almost to do this, able to do this entirely without the use of uh, carbamate and organophosphate uh, insecticides. Throughout the islands, uh, we had uh, about 2,500 uh, cooperators, 607 farms, and uh, 15,000 acres. For California, that might not be that impressive, but for Hawaii, which has a population of maybe only a million, uh, it, it, it was substantial. Some of the, uh, the, the major technical accomplishments, uh, uh, we had a good multi-agency uh, uh, cooperation, which uh, is often more difficult than uh, it sounds. Um, we had international collaboration because fruit flies are such a global problem. We, we had a number of uh, foreign countries, uh, uh, China, um, uh, Repub uh, Republic of China, uh, uh, French Polynesia, uh, Senegal, that, that, that came to Hawaii and have, have tried to implement these same approaches uh, in, in their countries. But the, the, the first thing that we tried to do was just to get the IPM approach uh, transferred to the farmers. And then we took these new technologies. So I'm going to kind of briefly go over some of these new technologies. Uh, uh, the first were some new monitoring methods. The second was to replace, uh, they, they were using malathion bait sprays before we started the program, so we uh, were able to change uh, over to this uh, GF120, and we were also able even to get an organic formulation, and then we came up with some uh, reduced risk uh, uh, male annihilation approaches. And if, if any of you are, are interested, um, there's still a website up 
uh, and running where you can get um, uh, information on this program and where you can get the products. And then there's there's also uh, a, a brochure that was put out at the at the end of the program, and that one also contains some uh, publications that may be of interest. So rather than list these publications, they're listed in in the back of that uh, that blue brochure. But uh, as I mentioned before this program, there was really nothing registered for fruit fly control in, in Hawaii. So uh, we had to start from, uh, from uh, uh, day one. And, and through this program and through the cooperation, we had good cooperation from a number of, 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 of industry people, uh, Dow AgroSciences, um, uh, Century, uh, uh, PharmaTech, and we were able to get some products out into the marketplace and we were able to uh, get registration. So, so s throughout this program, I think we've, we've, we, had, we registered methyl eugenol q -lure, and then probably about six or seven products. And uh, some of the first ones, and, and you're still using this, uh, this is typical in, in, Ho in California now, you have maybe 30,000 monitoring traps out there. Um, with, they're not using bucket traps, but they are using um, the, uh, they, they are still using NALAD and either methyl eugenol or q uh, on a wick. What, what we were able to convert to is we went to these uh, solid dispensers. This would be a, a methyl eugenol plug and then uh, a similar q plug. And then because there's such high populations in Hawaii, we modified these to bucket traps and this was used for, uh, for male annihilation until we got some of the, the newer products on the market. And then probably the flagship product of this uh, program was uh, this uh, uh, GF120 NF natural light fruit fly bay. And by the end of the program, as I mentioned, we had an organic uh, uh, formulation and uh, in many instances, the, uh, the growers uh, found some phytotoxicity or didn't want to put it on the plant, and so we have, uh, have come up with uh, these uh, bait stations. And uh, I know a number of you that are working with Olive Fly have, have also been working with this, where you don't even have to put the uh, GF120 on the, uh, the tree. You can uh, make some of these small bait stations and uh, you can control the flies just with the bait station. And then these are some, um, some male annihilation uh, 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 reduced risk formulations and products that we came up with. Uh, they've even been changing the name. Anytime you get out in the public, they were calling this uh, male annihilation technique and some people, many of the people in California became worried that the human males were gonna start becoming sterile and so there was a move afoot that uh, oh, we better change its name to male attraction technology. So, so anytime, I guess anytime you have a number of lawyers who are always interested in semantics, you have to be very careful how you uh, 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 name something. And, and this was a product that was developed in the Pacific. We didn't register the Bactromat ME, but uh, the Bactromat uh, uh, CL was registered. This contains fipronil, and it's interesting in that, that uh, there has been some evidence that, that the males pick this up, they go to mate, they don't die right away, they spread it to the females and the female stock. This has been well known with the social insects, they control termites and ants and whatnot, but uh, uh, with uh, insects that are not particularly uh, uh, in the category of social insects, this is, has been rare. And then there's a splat material, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more at, at the end of my talk, but this is an uh, acronym for Specialized Pheromone and Lure Application uh, Technology. It's basically a waxy carrier. It, you either put methyl eugenol or q -lure into it, and um, uh, you add spinosa. So it's another reduced risk uh, uh, fruit fly control product, and it's also uh, sprayable. But uh, uh, just some of the benefits, uh, the area-wide program made significant contributions to agriculture in Hawaii and instituted uh, 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 the growing of a greater diversity of crops. Um, it has made, uh, it allowed farmers to make significant cuts in pesticide use. Uh, 
The program helped improve Hawaii's environment and sustained <coughs> space, which uh, contributed to maintain the uh, island's tourism. And I don't, I think it's pretty much accepted today that if you can control insects through reduced risk uh, uh, products, it's uh, the way to go. The program also uh, led to uh, and a significant increase in the number of uh, commercial farms and uh, uh, some crops, it, it added to the diversity of the crops that were being grown. It's, and in Hawaii, what's basically happened is they've gotten away from sugar cane and um, uh, pineapple and have gone to uh, tropical fruits and, and vegetables. Um, uh, an assessment uh, uh, showed that the benefits were estimated to be about $6 million by 2011, that there's been a 32% uh, return, about $16 million now have been spent over, uh, let's say, the last 16 years. And it's a, 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 a custom in Hawaii that, uh, that uh, backyard growers share their products, so these, these uh, control approaches have been useful to these homeowners so that they have more fruits and vegetables to share with people on other islands and whatnot. Um, the uh, suppression of fruit flies, these approaches have been also uh, useful from a regional uh, uh, point of view in that, as I mentioned earlier, most of the area-wide uh, products that were developed during the last hundred years were developed in Hawaii. Well, this is kind of a new generation of, of uh, control products that are of interest to California, Florida, and, and some of the other warmer areas of the mainland. The, uh, the success uh, has also had international impact in that, uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, visited uh, the uh, People's Republic of China, Republic of China, um, French Polynesia, Guam, Taiwan, and they have also been interested in, in adopting these approaches and uh, trying these products. So these are some of the people that uh, have contributed to this program. And so I'm going to move to the, the second part of the presentation. So we're going to go down into the uh, southern hemisphere, uh, into French Polynesia. And uh, basically in, 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 in French Polynesia, it, the country is uh, is, is, uh, is made up of five major island chains. Uh, the Society Islands, which are the, the, the uh, most recognizable, are here in the center. Um, the Marquesas, which are up here. The Australia Islands are, are out here to the, uh, to the west. And then there's also the Tuamotos, which are mostly atolls. And then um, the Gambier Islands, which are uh, down to the south. Uh, it's about 118 islands with a land area of about 3,500 square miles. And uh, they're spread over uh, 4 million square kilometers. So they're spread over an area about the size of, uh, of Europe. The largest island, I think as most of you are aware, is uh, Tahiti. 69% uh, of the population lives in Tahiti. It's about 1,000 square miles in size. Um, has a population of uh, 270,000 people. And 16% uh, of these people live uh, in the capital of uh, Papiete. Uh, in, in, uh, 1996, uh, Oriental fruit fly was uh, dis discovered in, uh, in uh, French Polynesia. Uh, it was discovered in an area down here. Um, the suspicion, Hawaiian air had just started flying down here, and uh, some Hawaiian dancers had come down here for a dance contest, and, and uh, some of the friends they were visiting, this is where they first noticed the, the, the fruit fly. So they suspect that it came from Hawaii, although there isn't any um, genetic evidence that uh, that is true. Uh, in, in January of uh, 1997, uh, an eradication program was undertaken. It involved male annihilation, where they, uh, what they do is they would cut up coconut husks and so, uh, soak them in uh, methyl eugenol and uh, malathion. And would spread these over the entire island with uh, helicopters. And it was a, a very aggressive uh, program. Only, only the French can run these aggressive uh, 
uh, uh, programs, and uh, they uh, really put a lot of effort into uh, uh, trying to eradicate the uh, the infestation. And then they also used the uh, malathion uh, protein baits, and they did most of this by spraying. Initially, the infestations were around the coastal areas, so they really didn't need to spray the the um, the protein baits by air, although this this may have been uh, a mistake. And as you can see, uh, they had uh, some some pretty pretty good success. They had uh, uh, six blocking campaigns, and obviously they almost had the uh, the the population eradicated. But they had some funding cuts and. They were confident that the fly was gone, as good as gone. And unfortunately, they uh, were, uh, uh, got, were a little too optimistic. And eventually, um, after 18 more treatment campaigns, they, uh, were, the, the fly came back worse than ever. And so now, in, uh, in, uh, in French Polynesia, there's four species. You can see most of these have been have come in recently. Their Kirkai was there since 20, 1928. The Queensland fruit fly probably came in from uh, Australia in 1970. Uh, the Oriental fruit fly, as I mentioned, in 96, and the Pacific fruit fly in uh, 1997. And so it was in in uh, around 2002 that uh, myself and a couple of my colleagues were able to get an FAS grant. And so we tried a uh, biological um, control uh, program. Some, some history of the oriental fruit fly in, in Hawaii. It was introduced in 1945. It infests over 150 different species of uh, fruits and vegetables. And uh, it is uh, the, the primary breeding host is uh, common guava and uh, strawberry guava. But what was interesting is what the uh, oriental fruit fly did is it displaced the Mediterranean fruit fly. The Mediterranean fruit fly used to be the most common species in Hawaii, and, and with the introduction of oriental fruit fly, uh, uh, that ceased to be the case. But it's interesting. I'll show you some data here in a few minutes that uh, uh, is, is significant to this uh, same situation. <laughs> Just briefly, uh, this is the, the little uh, Braconid parasitoid that uh, uh, I'm calling Phopius aerosanus. Uh, uh, with the uh, establishment of, of oriental fruit fly, uh, they instigated the, the uh, largest classical biological control campaign against fruit flies. They introduced 32 different natural enemies. Um, uh, originally, Longicaudata, this is a, a uh, a larval parasitoid. It doesn't attack the egg. It was the most common species. Then they introduced this Phopius aerosanus, which attacks a late stage of the egg, and it became the predominant parasitoid. But then finally, accidentally, they did not purposely introduce Phopius aerosanus. It just came in as uh, with some of the pupae that they had, had brought in. It became uh, the dominant species. And, and with some, some surveys that I've done, uh, it makes up uh, about 90% of the parasitoid guild now in, in Hawaii attacking uh, fruit flies. But anyway, you look at it, Phopius aerosanus in Hawaii is considered the most successful uh, example of biological control of, of fruit flies uh, worldwide. And it is also the primary <coughs> parasitoid of uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly. And so they have tried these, uh, uh, these campaigns um, uh, previously in, in Hawaii um, or in, in the Pacific where they have released Longicaudata and uh, the Arisanus with uh, uh, kind of mixed uh, results uh, uh, against Queensland fruit fly. It's, it's never been much higher than maybe uh, 10 to 15 percent. Um, and then it has become established in many of these islands. It may be that uh, nobody really took good pre-release and post-release uh, uh, data. But what we did, we established a small um, uh, insectary there. We, we took good uh, pre-release samples. We processed a lot of fruits, made sure the parasitoid was not there, got some sort of a handle on numbers of, of fruit flies that came out of the, uh, the different hosts. 
And then um, we began shipments in uh, December of 2002 of Fopius erysianus and wound up maybe about uh, 10 shipments uh, for a total of, of 500,000 uh, total. And uh, we were able to either recover from fruits or, or rear, you can see uh, the numbers of, of, of parasitoids that we were able to rear in, in uh, the laboratory there. And through uh, releases primarily in some selected areas, we, we were able to establish it throughout the uh, entire island. And uh, what has occurred is, is very interesting, and this is, uh, uh, I was telling Jim yesterday that this is what, what I'm doing during the next year. I have 10 years now of, of, of data, but this is uh, a four host. This is uh, tropical almond, of course mango, common guava, and uh, tropical almond. And as you can see, Kirkeye and Tryonide used to be the dominant species. Dorsalis, over the last year, take a look, is totally displacing the other species, <coughs> except in, 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 in some fruits. And then, of course, here, Fopius erysatus has become uh, very common. With some of the, our results during the first five years uh, have shown that uh, we, we get parasiti parasitism rates between about 50 and 70 percent. There's been a 75 percent reduction in oriental fruit fly, uh, maybe 80 percent uh, of Queensland fruit fly, and a 97 percent reduction in, in Kirkguy. Uh, oriental fruit fly has displaced Queensland fruit fly in, in, in a number of hosts. Uh, as I mentioned, parasitism rates of uh, Fopius have been as high as 70 percent, and um, uh, Fopius erysianus has, has, has reduced infestation fruits by about 75 percent. And for, for uh, French Polynesia, with all these islands, we have, have also been able to move to some of the other islands. This is Morea. So what we've done is, is from Papiete, we've introduced it into Morea, uh, Reatea, Taha'a and uh, Huahini, and they, they were probably going to uh, also uh, introduce it into Bora Bora. So you, in French Polynesia, you travel to one of the main islands by airplane, and then you usually um, uh, uh, go by boat, which in the Marquesas Islands. So we flew out to the Marquesas Island, uh, we went into Iva Oi, and then by boat, we released it in some of these southern islands, and then uh, they took it by plane up here. And uh, it's also been uh, introduced into uh, the Marquesas. So it, we have a sustainable program that the French Polynesians have been able to handle themselves. And um, um, it, for the investment of the $50,000, it's been a very uh, successful program. We've also introduced the Longicaw data and are finishing up some evaluations of that. Well, with that, um, we will move into California. We were uh, going through some of your uh, old newspaper articles. Uh, uh, that's where I found Jim's picture, was in, in one of these old newspaper articles. But he, he got rid of the picture. But, but this was one of the, the, I guess this must have been when Jerry Brown was last in office, because uh, I, I think it's about the same date. But uh, um, we, we, we kind of found this interesting when we were looking through the uh, uh, the, the article, but I want to just show you one of the reasons that we are doing some of the work that we're doing. I'm just going to show you this one slide. It's some of the data that I've gotten from California. There actually have been maybe 10 species of Bactrocera that have been um, uh, introduced. The initial detection was 1960. Over the last 50, 50 years, you found um, uh, you found Bactrocera or Salus in 44 of those years. Total detections, 110. Eradication events, 87. Uh, quarantines initiated have been 14. And, and if you, you want to do some statistics, it's been a total of 1,380, a range of 1 to 535, and an average of 12.5 per year. So um, uh, this has been the situation over, say, the, uh, the, the, the last 50 years, which uh, has, has uh, caused me to, to do some of the, uh, the current work that we're, 
we're now doing. So I'm going to very quickly, um, I think I can get through this in about five minutes, uh, uh, just talk about uh, the evaluation of some of these uh, Q-lure and uh, methyl eugenol traps with the solid lures and then um, this, uh, this new product that we're working with, the, uh, the SPLAT map. And of course, we, 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 have, we did most of these tests, although we've done a lot of the weathering tests here in, in California, we've shipped them back over to uh, Hawaii, so we've done most of the, uh, the bioassays in, in Hawaii, and we did some of them in, in, in French Polynesia. But for, just as an introduction for some of those, uh, some of you not familiar with these flies, over 90% of the day sign flies respond to either methyl eugenol or q -lor. And so these would be the Bactrocera species and the, um, the Dapa species. And of the 73 uh, species that are agricultural pests, 41 respond to Q-lure raspberry ketone. Uh, uh, Q-lure uh, hydrolyzes and, and, and becomes raspberry ketone. So that's why some people often just say Q-lure raspberry ketone. And then 22 to ME and, and 10 to neither. California maintains over 30,000 and 20,000 traps, respectively. So you've got a lot of traps out there. And so um, it's important that you have the uh, best available products in, in those, uh, those traps. Um, currently, as I mentioned early in this talk, uh, uh, the, they're baited with uh, either methyl, liquid methyl eugenol or Q-lure and uh, liquid uh, NALED. And then similarly for these eradications that you do, usually there is a, a quarantine area and uh, they come up with this mixture called Minugel. I'll show you that in a minute. And this is what's called this Minugel uh, Nalet treatments for eradication. But the bottom line is that liquid lures and Nalet are the standard for both detection and uh, eradication programs. And since NALED usually is not labeled for fruit flies, the, you're always having to deal with um, uh, special local needs permits or uh, 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 emergency program uh, uh, permits. But briefly, I'm just going to um, show you some, some research that we've been doing. I'm going to talk about these solid uh, 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 lure dispensers with an insecticide. I'm going to uh, mention one where they're putting both methyl eugenol and q -lure into a single product. So instead of having to put out 60,000 traps, you can put out 30,000 traps if you had that lure in, uh, you had both lures in the same trap. It's been, many people have looked at this, but it depends on your formulation. So there are some possibilities. And then I'm going to just say a few brief things about the splat map. These are these, uh, these new wafers. They can contain um, either methyl eugenol or DDVP. Um, uh, this one would have the, uh, the Q-lure and the DDVP. We're doing, we've done all of our tests. This is the typical trap that is the standard in, in uh, California. Uh, you're using these uh, Jackson traps with the, um, with the uh, uh, cotton wicks. And then, I'm, uh, this is the way that they control these areas. So basically they come up with a, a, a quarantine area, they increase their trapping density, get an idea how many traps are in there, and then go up and down the street and uh, squirt this material onto the uh, telephone poles. This is the mini gel, the dive room, which is NALED, and the um, uh, methyl eugenol. And there have been some incidents where some some of this splashed onto some Mercedes Benzes and took the paint off the top, or some little old lady was getting into her car and got it squirted on her hair. So, so, and then, and then the utility people have said, well, what's happening to all of our guys that are scrambling up and down these telephone poles and that NALED is getting onto their jeans? So, the utility people have been saying, well, I, I don't know if we want you guys spraying NALAD on all of our telephone poles. So it's become kind of a contentious issue in California. They, CDFA was uh, very generous and, and did give us $200,000 for product development. And, and we're just about, uh, hopefully, at the end of this. Just as a quick review, the splat is this waxy material um, combined with spinosad and methyl eugenol or Q. And then these are just some quick results. Uh, 
this malodymy wafer, if you take a look at these results and the results, we've done these tests many, many times, um, it is outperforming. This would be basically your control, but take a look. It's been capturing six times the number of flies that, that you've been getting with the, uh, the, uh, the current methodology. It hasn't been quite as good with, um, with the Q-Lure. These tests were done uh, against uh, Bactrosera trionide, which is a Q-Lure responding um, uh, fly. But if you just look at maybe for the first, uh, uh, say the first 10 months, they were comparable to what you're using now. We found that by replacing the CL with uh, raspberry ketone that you can extend, extend the period. Uh, these are the, um, uh, the combination uh, MCs would have methyl eugenol and cure. We've got some now that have methyl eugenol and raspberry ketone. With the <laughs> ME, it has not been quite as, um, as uh, it, the, the combinations have, have, have not been superior with q -lore, they have been superior. So the trick is you've got to get a high concentration of methyl eugenol in combination with a lower amount of, of, of q -lore. get your DDBP in there properly, and there is a possibility that you could use the one wafer for detection, but then you're going to have to have well-trained uh, trappers so that they can identify the difference between the flies, because you have been over the last few years picking up both q -lure and um, methyl eugenol responding flies. As far as the splat, these, uh, the, the results have been pretty outstanding. We have pretty much matched or uh, been a little bit better with the splat, spinosad, methyl eugenol. Um, because the insects do not feed on the q -lure, uh, the results haven't been quite as good in the uh, They've been statistically equal, but arithmetically, um, the uh, media gel nailet has been a little bit better because the, all the fly has to do is land on this material and it's as good as dead. With uh, the, the splat spinosad against the cooler flies because they don't feed on it so voraciously, um, the results have been good, but uh, not quite as good as the, the methyl eugenol. So, um, uh, just to summarize these tests, uh, these uh, methyl eugenol um, uh, mallet solid dispensers with the DDVP have been outstanding better than anything that's on the market. The, um, the CL wafers have been uh, uh, about equal with some new formulations with raspberry ketone. They could be the way to go. The uh, mixtures uh, with the Methyl eugenol and Culor in the same dispenser have been um, uh, very promising for the Culor responding flies, but unless you get the high amount of, 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 me of methyl eugenol in there, you, uh, it, it, there it, it won't be as good against the methyl eugenol flies. And uh, with the uh, Splat Mat ME, um, it's been uh, equivalent or better than the, the, the currently used uh, uh, products. And uh, the CL has been uh, pretty, pretty promising. So with that, um, I am going to uh, do some more shameless advertising for our Pacific Branch uh, meetings in Hawaii. And uh, so anyways, uh, one last invitation. Uh, the 27th of next month, we are this isn't Hawaii, this is uh, uh, Morea. But uh, we want all of you to come on out to the, the meetings. They're uh, promising to be some of the highest attended meetings. We've already got uh, close to 300 registrations. The record, I think, is 310 for Portland. So we've already got 300 people registered. Uh, Jim will be, uh, has organized a nice uh, symposium on uh, fruit flies. So those of you interested in fruit flies and uh, interested in surfing or just hanging out at the beach, I uh, encourage all of you to uh, come out to those meetings. So. With that, um, thank you very much. And if you know there's any questions, sure. I was curious uh, with regard to uh, the Pacific area. 
Is there any feel for the role of the predators in general with regard uh, to their activity on the first part of their action? Uh, probably the best predator are ants. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, I am not too familiar with, the, with, with other predators, but, but ants have been identified. And in Hawaii, we do have some, some obscure uh, generalist predators that, 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 that do attack fruit flies. The, the, the best literature is on the Anastrafa species, and I, I think there's some, some, some good ones there. But, um, other than ants, I have not been impressed with, with anything that, but, but ants, can, they do take their toll on, on fruit flies. They're uh, just voracious. And when we put some of these traps out, the ants will be, unless you put something around the, the, uh, the, the, the trap, they're just hauling them away faster than they can get to them, so. Any other questions? Yeah, Jim. Sure. So uh, the oriental fruit fly, I, I plotted those um, back in the, uh, what would that be, the late 80s, early 90s. And it started, yeah. pardon? Long. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I plotted the oriental fruit fly finds in California uh, back in uh, late 80s, 90s, along with the medfly. And they started, I think I'm right on this, down in LA, in, the, in that area, and then they moved north. And just a few years ago, we caught one in Sacramento. And I mean, every, there's every evidence from these repeat captures and the progression from south to north and so forth that these things are established. I, I would bet uh, a lot of money that there, I mean, it's no doubt in my mind that the dorsalis is established in, in California. Um, so when you plot these, um, um, I'll be curious to see what you, uh, conclusions you come to. And I'll, I, so here's a question. I mean, have they done any genetics at all on any of this, uh, that, you know, the, the genetics have, 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 to my knowledge, have not been done on these. It's uh, it's unbelievable. And and uh, we are putting a big effort at our laboratory now into developing a, a, a genomics uh, a project on this dorsalis complex because I mean it is just spread totally around the world. It's like it just spread totally around the equator. It's into South America. It'll probably be in in. Um, um, Central America, uh, it's, they, it's gotten into Australia, although they got it out. It's all through China, all through India, and it's just gone from uh, East Africa straight over to West Africa. And what's interesting is that it's totally displacing the Ceratita species. So here you have a continent where the Ceratitas were uh, native, and they're just, just getting totally pushed out. The, the people don't even they don't even look at the medfly trap anymore. They just go over to this Factocera trap and it's just overflowing. And so they're just totally mesmerized and they, they really don't know what to do about it. Which uh, is interesting, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend the next year looking at these competitive relationships in French Polynesia. Because, because obviously uh, uh, it's a very aggressive species within um, the, the species within the same genus it even outcompetes many of the flies that are on the same host. And then with the Ceratitis, the, the Africans are turning out one paper after another, but this, this has been known since the 50s in Hawaii. There must be 50. But I guess after 30 or 40 years go by, everybody forgets about all those old papers, and then they just look at the web of science, which might be just showing the recent one. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're not looking at these things. But this is a big topic. And, and my question has always been, and this has always been controversial, is, is it possible that some of these oriental fruit flies are hitching rides on planes physically? And, and you know, in Hawaii, you cannot put a fruit fly uh, uh, host around an airport. We had a laboratory director that went adios because he tried to build a rearing facility near an airport and they lost $10 million. But I have, I have actually had a backpack maybe that had methylene and all, and I have seen uh, a flies actually come into the airplanes. And um, that could be a possibility. But 
my question is why aren't some of these uh, possibilities of being investigated? It seems there's just a great amount of effort put into defense of current policies and whatnot, but from a scientific point of view, um, and, and you know, I have to be thankful to CDFA for looking at new control procedures because I think that that's what we should be doing is investing in, in new thinking and new approaches and looking at data very, um, uh, you know, quantitatively. So, so you know, I agree that this data need, needs to be scrutinized. I mean, are are there Dorsalis is a tropical species. Yes. Yeah. And so yet this is Mediterranean. And so is there evidence that, that it can uh, thrive in a uh, Mediterranean climate? Or just, I mean, are there I, any... I, I, I would say this, if, and, and, and this, they started plotting the data for um, Africa because it's a new invasion. And, and it is on the edge of the range. But they're picking, you know, South Africa. And it is, uh, it becomes um, relatively cold there. That they're having incursions of the Bactrocera. It's coming right into the north, and it's spreading over large areas. And you know, I was having a few beers with some of these South Africans last week, and I said, "Well, you guys don't have to worry." And he said, "We do have to worry." And so I, I, I think that uh, there's, if it's going to places like South Africa, it's going to can come into. Uh, California. Yeah, another question? Um, yeah, mentioning that, because I was wondering why uh, um, New Zealand's escaped, and I was expecting it because it's a bit cooler there. But now that you mentioned that they're uh, arriving in, in um, South Africa, um, how has how is, how is, uh, New Zealand escaped? Uh, you know, New Zealand is a model country for uh, developing um, uh, invasion scenarios. They, they are meticulous in maintaining um, detection uh, arrays. And they have had some introductions like of MedFly and whatnot, but they've gotten rid of it. And they are on top of it. I mean, they invest a large amount of money into people uh, listing what the most probable introductions are, um, having an array, having a, um, an actual eradication uh, program. And uh, same thing with Australia. They, they have people, they will spend more time talking to you about what possible insects can get into their country from the United States than you would believe. They, you know, they don't want to talk about how to get rid of them and whatnot. They want to talk about stopping them from getting in. And they're, you know, they're very right wing about it. I mean, you know, they just, you know, Lord knows where you'd feel you would be, Mike. Yeah, just maybe a general question about the, the, the sustainability of the of the program, so so USDA and, and the Hawaii Department of Agriculture are kind of combining on on trying to uh, annihilate males and reduce population right, right. and protecting almost everything that's grown in in, in, in this right. area. Right, we, we were interested in, in giving placing those products in the hands of the farmers and in the homeowners so they could do it. But they st I still spray. Will they still spray? They still have to spray. They stuck. They they do need to treat. Okay. And, and, and a criticism of the products has been that they've been too expensive. And so that's still, there's still some work to do. And I've tried to get grants and stuff to finish up some of this because we got registrations we never thought we would get. But as you're well aware, when you do extension work or, or you take, you go to say some flower growers and stuff and say you have a new product and whatnot, there's always a reluctance to move away from what they're, what, what they're using. And then we need to get stores to sell these products. So my center director comes to me and says, I want to see this stuff in the store that's down the street from my house. And, and I have to say that that's been one of the, uh, the weaknesses is that, that we needed a couple more years just to get these people to use these things. Yes? I was amazed that you got so many, uh, I got permission to introduce so many parasites into uh, it was back in the 1950s. <laughs> that, that's the answer to your question, and 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 it's a very uh, it, it's a very well taken question because there's been some new parasitoids that have been sitting up in quarantine in Honolulu for 10 years. Yeah. And they still are saying, well, we don't know if we want to release them or not. The last introduction that you guys were able to 
Well, they, they've, uh, they, they've been releasing things for, um, uh, for this gall wasp. They, they got an introduction. They had this, this gall wasp that's um, been um, stripping uh, all of these trees. Some of them were endemics. And so they were going to lose certain endemics. And so they got special permission to do those releases. But I'll tell you right now, the releases are becoming far and few between. Oh, yeah. And, and it, it, it has to be a very popular cause. So you have to go get some stakeholders that include environmentalists, that, you know. Um, you have to be affecting them, um, Yeah. And, and but there, there's going to be there'll be some talks in Hawaii about that. We have a whole section on that, and you know, their their biological control. There, there may be you know some criticisms of it, but there there is a place for. It. And their situations were uh, some native species. We have a couple of native species that would have gone extinct. They had already gone out and collected and frozen the seeds, and and you know it's uh, uh, these erythrinia. Uh, hosts mm -hmm. and and the wasp would be spread uh, the the gall wasp would be spread in the uh, jet, uh, airstream in the jet stream and then they just dropped down different places and they picked it up like in Guam they picked it up in um, Saipan they picked it up in uh, Hawaii and they had no choice but in two years they did they did all of the um, the um, non-target testing they picked up some little uh, uh, parasitoids of the gall wasp in Madagascar, and and they brought it back. Roger, and then it suggests that you use those long-term uh, parasitoids, you know, ten years in uh, in quarantine, and have Jim Carrey do geriatric studies on. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, see Roger Vargas give his talk. Um, we are taking the lunch if any graduate students want to uh, continue asking Roger questions, uh, you can accompany us. All right, thank you. Good talk. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs>